will move, I wouldn't venture to profit, to prophesy, being neither a prophet nor the daughter of a prophet. <laughs> Dr. Helvig, uh, you said that uh, institutions cannot give life, if I remember correctly, and uh, I agree, but it seems to me that institutions are supposed to enhance life, and isn't there a, a danger of us uh, putting institution versus spirit in such a way that we are diverted from the task of uh, addressing the task of um, improving the way in which the institution enhances life. Or yes, can, I, can I like the way you put the question. I, I agree with what you imply by it, namely that um, the kind of stance that rejects institution and says, um, it's unhelpful, therefore we just don't bother with it, would also be, um, would also involve a refusal to reform the institution. Yeah, I'm, I'm in agreement with that. The reason I slanted my talk the way I did is that I think at present a lot of lay effort is being wasted on bemoaning what the institution isn't and what the institution doesn't do, and thereby we forget the, that the life of the church is really not limited to institutional maneuvers. That's why I slanted it that way. But I would not want to be understood as meaning it's not of interest to reform the church structures. I think it is of interest to reform the st church structures, but I just wouldn't want all of our energy to be uh, siphoned off into that. Dr. Helwig, I don't know how, how neatly I can phrase this one, but it, my question is concerned with authority um, as it might apply in the modern communities, which uh, you emphasized quite a bit. Uh, you um, point, pointed out that um, as communities got larger, they became more structured, and then certain people were uh, given authority to define and interpret the teachings of the church. Um, now, it seems to me that in the first 50 or 60 years of the church, that St. Paul was telling people, Follow what I taught you. Uh, uh, even then, they were talking about um, people straying from the uh, the true teachings of of Jesus. So um, then, my question is, I guess, would you exclude authority from your modern communities? No. My point was, first of all that the task of handing on the message, the faith, the conviction, the vision, became in course of time more and more professional, be became more and more an assigned technical task. And the reason I stress that is that I was preparing for what I was going to say afterwards about the various revivals which became Protestant in the sense that the church didn't um, draw them in, which were prompted by the understanding we all have to meditate on the scriptures and share our insight and pass it along. So my concern was not really with the question of authority at that point, but with the question of passing on the vision and the message and whose task it was and who had the right to do that. Later on in the talk, I said that the earlier church, and I meant more or less the first three centuries, had a sense of authority which really could be equated with expertise. Paul was able to say to those communities, 
the message I gave you is the right message and don't listen to anyone who contradicts it because he had brought them the gospel. He, he had in the first place uh, uh, evangelized the community, therefore he was closer to the source. Um, for some time in the patristic literature we get the sense that they are very careful to show why certain bishops are worthy of the closest attention because after all they heard so and so speak who heard so and so speak and they have the tradition as they brought it from the older churches. Likewise we get the sense that again and again certain church communities, local churches, are deferred to by the others because they're earlier foundations and so it's understood there is more expertise. Likewise the words of martyrs are marked down with uh, the greatest attention and reverence because after all when you're on the point of really giving your life for the faith you know it from the inside, you know what it's about. So my point was, that the second point was, that from that kind of understanding of what authority meant, we moved in the fourth century to a different perspective because bishops became um, functionaries of the empire as well as leaders of a Christian community and as functionaries of the empire they had power to command and impose sanctions and there seems to be a gradual shift in understanding so that now authority is not so much the expertise as we would suppose if I said he's a great authority on French literature. I don't mean that whatever he commands you you have to do under sanctions, I mean he knows what he's talking about. So um, from that sense of authority as expertise, there appears to have been a steady shift in the direction of authority as power to command and impose sanctions for disobedience. That was my point. So they were really uh, two different observations I was making there.
vision it come in, and where does that lead us as a church? And, and like, can we get beyond or into this, what seems to be impenetrable unit, and feel not only that they're at home there, the people who live in households of faith, but that the church can be at home there as well. Mm-hmm. I do, yes. I think for centuries we never supposed otherwise. And I had the fortune to live in Italy for three years where they still don't suppose otherwise. They suppose, for instance, would be very undignified for the men to show up in church every Sunday. But um, that nevertheless you can have all manner of devotional customs in the home and that nevertheless, you, the real question of how you stand with God has to do with your family relationships and your relationships with your neighbors and so on. I'm not saying that Italy is um, fragrant with virtue and that we are otherwise, but that there's a kind of earthiness, a rootedness of the church there. Um, and I think there's a reason why I saw it there, and I've seen it in some other peasant cultures in Europe that I have, was privileged to live in as a child. And we often don't see it in the societies that we know. I was at the USCC, that is the US Catholic Conferences, oh, consultation, I think, on Familiaris Consortio just a few weeks ago. And Bishop Stafford, speaking on behalf of USCC and the Family Life Office, stood up in plain daylight in front of a microphone with people recording him and the press there and said, the trouble is that ever since the Council of Trent, the church has been engaging in anti-family legislation while um, talking about supporting the family. And um, Bishop Stafford, justified that remark on the basis of some research done by a French sociologist into the um, oh, the consequences of our parish organization, our sacramental structures, um, uh, the pattern of our catechesis, and so on, other things. I won't go into the detail of that. My own impression is that Indeed, in the countries that are heavily affected by the Council of Trent, among which Italy doesn't figure, um, the countries that are heavily affected by the Council of Trent do have a very awkward tension that on the one hand there is an anxious sense they mustn't get out of control. We must make sure that the hierarchy and the clergy keep them Catholic, keep them from falling into Protestantism. And we must, which, you know, at the time of the Reformation, of course, was an internal quarrel and was passionately felt, and now we sort of laugh about it a bit. But um, there was great, great anxiety. We must control it. We must get in there. We must make sure we hold on to them that they don't fall away into unorthodox doctrines and unorthodox practices and so on. And then on the other hand, we've had, at least since the time of Pius X at the turn of the century, a great sense that there ought to be, well, I know, I should say at least since the time of Leo XIII actually, a great sense that there ought to be more lay participation and the laity ought to be responsible and the church ought to be growing from the grassroots and so on. As you're probably well aware, because of the, uh, your involvement in the Catholic family movement, in the earlier part of this century, there were all kinds of calls being issued to Catholic action, but Catholic action was defined as the participation of the laity in the apostolate of the hierarchy. <laughs> and now, of course, we'd be in inclined to say that um, hierarchic and um, priestly ministry is a particular participation in the life of the people of God. You know, we'd be inclined to turn it around and make the other basic. I think, first of all, that we are in difficulties because there's a real tension there, that while there is a concern that certain 
official persons, whether clergy or whoever, must somehow supervise and be sure they keep control of what all Catholics are doing all the time so as to keep them Catholic and keep them orthodox and keep them observant. While you're doing that, you're therefore necessarily saying that what the families do on their own uh, isn't the real thing until it's been supervised. And on the other hand, you've got this great thrust to think about church quite differently and say the fundamental task is reconciliation, is charity, is uh, liberation, redemption, and the faith is handed on in the ordinary relationships in which we live, which is primarily our family relationship and so on. And the two are intention. What I understand as family apostolate is first of all what we ourselves do in uh, living our family life in Christ and secondly what we as families do for one another to sustain one another in that. And the people that I think have implemented it in a most uh, thorough and exciting way are many of the Comunidades de Base in, for instance, the Philippines where they haven't had priestly service and where whatever they are as Christian community is what they do for one another and what they do together in some parts of Latin America and some even as close to me as Bethesda in Maryland. You know, there really are some uh, groups like that that have taken off and are doing it. I, I think that comes closest to it. I think we'll exercise some of the compassion that Dr. <laughs> Helwig, Helwig recommended and get her off her feet. Uh, she's whetted the appetite, I, I assume, by now, and uh, I just want to recall to you that the lectures continue tomorrow at 10 o'clock and at 2 in the afternoon, and it will be in the same place at those times. Uh, immediately following uh, the procedure here tonight, if any of you would like to meet Dr. Helwig personally or simply have a cup of coffee and meet other people, uh, you're welcome to follow the first ones who go out the door, this particular door here, to the faculty lounge area where there will be some coffee and things to eat. So you're entirely welcome, all of you, okay? At this point, and finally, I would like to invite one of our majors in religious studies here at the Mount, Lise Steele, to thank Dr. Helwig, please. You once wrote, Dr. Helwig, God's call is always when a human need intersects your own capacity to fill it. I feel that this evening you have expanded on that reflection. You have given us all kinds of new insights and a new lay approach to the ministries of the church, never forgetting, of course, that structures do not beget life. And I think you have defined the lay laity very positively, and we can become the dynamic church that we are meant to be. Thank you very much. Expertise. Um, and so without further ado, I'd like to call upon Dr. Helwig. Good morning. I'm happy to be with you again. And I promise that I won't go on talking for two hours this morning. Uh, but what I'll do is fit myself into your um, class schedule. So I'll finish at 5 of 11 giving an opportunity for anyone who wants to go, but then I'll be happy to answer questions for those who want to stay afterwards. The topic that I promised to address this morning is a rather quaint one. And if you haven't heard it before, you'll be um, a little bewildered. You know that the term good news to the poor is a biblical one, 
a New Testament one. Um, in fact, a New Testament one taken from the Isaiah prophecy. But the term has come to have a very uh, controversial significance today. About 15 years ago, a German Catholic theologian by the name of J.B. Metz presented a very provocative talk which was published afterwards as an essay in a collection in Concilium. If anybody is interested, I'll give you the exact reference for it later. But in this essay, in this um, presentation, he presented a thesis which he called the future in the memory of suffering. And the thesis runs something like this. If you are a Christian, then you know that the pivot of history, the center of history, is the cross of Jesus. And you know that the meeting ground for Christians, the birthplace for Christians as Christians, is in the Eucharistic gathering that takes Christians directly to the cross. But, says uh, Metz, what perhaps we've forgotten is that that means that the revelation of God in Jesus invites us to look at history, at the meaning of our lives, the meaning of the world, to look at history upside down from the way we usually look, to look at it from the vantage point, the perspective of the losers, the marginated, the excluded, because that is where the unfinished agenda for history, the unfinished agenda of the redemption is to be found. Now that's quite a thesis. He's saying we usually look at our identity, the purpose of life, and so on, from the point of view of those people who have made a mark in history, from the point of view of those who have organized, structured our social life the way, in fact, we found it, from the point of view, literally, of those who have conquered in history and shaped society their way. From the point of view, more subtly, of those who have managed to corner the goods of the earth, who have managed to stamp our experience and our relationship with their way of wanting it. And Metz's thesis is, once you are a Christian, you know that you have to turn the whole thing upside down. And you know that because in Jesus, God identifies himself, God speaks, God shows himself, rather in the suffering of the poor, the excluded, the marginated. It takes a while to assimilate that. In fact, that claim has gained volume and gained adherence and become a groundswell because there are today many spokesmen, spokeswomen also, on behalf of the very poor, on behalf of the oppressed, on behalf of the suffering, on behalf of the forgotten of the world, who have made that thesis their own, trying to voice on behalf of the poor, their experience, the experience of the poor, in which that thesis would be verified. And I'm here to tell you that that is one of the most controversial claims that is being made in professional theology today. If, the, if you want to get professional theologians truly angry at you, truly upset, and arguing with real passion, such as is not often displayed in professional theology, you only need to propose that thesis. Why? Because it really 
claims that there is an expertise that does not come from book learning, that doesn't come from studying the history and the philosophy and the flow of ideas. There is an expertise that does not come from book learning which is more fundamental, which has, so to speak, a role of judging and discerning the expertise that comes from book learning. This is a very deep claim. Now, what I would like to do today, because most of you are not professional theologians, and so I don't have to anticipate that you're going to be very uh, angry and feel very threatened by this, what I would like to do is rather just to unfold a little what is in that claim, how it relates to the gospel, and how that relates to all of us. That claim, I think, is a very extreme and very um, urgent form of the general claim that theology doesn't find its ancestry in books, that ideas don't live on the library shelves, but that ideas really live in people and their everyday experience, and that the immediate ancestry of theology and of Christian doctrine is in the experience of people who discover the sinfulness of their situation in life, the alienation, the bitterness, the harshness of their situation in life, and who in trying to live as followers of the way of Jesus also discover an understanding of what it is that causes the pain, what it is that causes the suffering. This is rooted, if you like, in the scandal of Jesus. I already met, mentioned or began with Metz's thesis that the cross of Jesus at the center of history, at the center of our experience, really turns things upside down in our way of looking at reality. But it isn't only the cross of Jesus. Jesus began to be a scandal long before that. He was a scandal because he seemed to be confused as to who were the sinners and who were the just. Again and again in the Gospels, you find a protest about the way he related to people, that he seemed to associate with the disreputable and not give proper recognition and respect to the pious, the devout, the virtuous. And Jesus again and again explained himself in terms like this. For instance, uh, that he said, well, a doctor, a physician, doesn't go around looking for people who are well. He attends to the sick. That's where he's able to make a difference. And he explained himself in terms such as the story of the lost coin and the lost sheep that a person who is a housekeeper, a woman, who notices that she has lost some money, doesn't say, don't worry about it, I have some more money. Rather, she's very concerned and she'll turn the house upside down until she finds where she put the money. And that someone who is herding sheep will not say, it's all right, I have 99 others. But in fact, he will be very concerned to go out and find the lost sheep. Most of all, Jesus tried to explain what he was about in a story about a lost son. And I'm going to talk about that more in the second uh, lecture later on today. In any case, the thesis of Jesus in his preaching is that his mission begins there where people experience their oppression their suffering, their alienation, their general sense of discomfort that things are not right. 
And the practice of Jesus is exactly like that, that he begins wherever people are in distress, healing the sick, consoling the confused, the bewildered, the suffering, the upset, giving hope to people who are staggering around in a state of quiet despair, suggesting community solidarity to the bewildered and scattered poor of the Palestine of his day, and so forth. The challenge, as the early Christians saw it, was so keen, the early followers of Jesus were so keen, that the sayings of Jesus, which we know as the Beatitudes, were taken by them in a sense in which they were quite likely not originally intended. In the Beatitudes, in which we see, we hear Jesus saying, blessed are the poor, uh, the humble and defenseless people, the ordinary, the persecuted, and so on. In those sayings, it's quite likely that the original intention was to console a community of followers of Jesus who indeed were suffering and to whom it was important to hold out hope. But so uh, stark and so startling and urgent was the challenge of this thesis of Jesus that the early followers of Jesus began to take up those Beatitudes in a different sense, that if you wanted to share the blessing, you should somehow share the poverty of the poor. In fact, the whole tradition of the religious life, the vowed religious life, uh, follows on that strand of um, thinking, on that strand of understanding, that to see properly what the good news is, you had better identify yourself in some way in your own experience with the suffering of the excluded, the poor, the oppressed, the marginated or left out people, the mourners, the defenseless, and so on. That challenge has arisen in a stark new way in our times with the claim that comes out of the various fields of the world where people are particularly suffering oppression and where there are Christian spokesmen on their behalf. As I said before, I shouldn't say spokesmen because many of the the speakers are women. Um, That challenge has come out in a particularly sharp way again in the thesis that to understand the gospel in its pristine freshness, to understand the gospel as truly good news and not just a rule of life that you better accept because it's official and it's been endorsed and uh, it's probably right and it makes life more complicated, but you better do it anyway. To understand the gospel as truly good news, as a real breakthrough, is the thesis, you really need either to be yourself among the poor or to identify with your own life situation, your own experience with the poor or at least to listen very carefully to the poor. And the reasons that are given for that are that those who suffer from the structures of society are the ones who really know there is something wrong. And if you don't know there is something wrong, you don't understand why there is any need for redemption, for salvation, for rescue, for liberation. If your place in your society is really quite comfortable and the suffering in your life is incidental, the odd illness, the occasional death of a friend, the occasional disappointment, then you are not going to understand, this is their thesis, you are not going to understand the challenge 
of the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ, the good news of a radical breakthrough from an order of sin and alienation into a whole new life, a whole new structuring of things. But if you are suffering from the present order, you're likely to be very tuned in to a message that offers hope because you're likely to see what is wrong, what is sinful in the present structure of things. To put that another way, those who suffer, those who are poor, those who are oppressed, are likely to want change. Now mind you, wanting change is not necessarily the same as acting out of hope because it may be a wishful thinking with no willingness to take the risk. You will remember the Moses story of Exodus, how hard it is for uh, the call of God to penetrate Moses and make him respond with a willingness to take the risk, how hard it is for Moses to persuade the overseers to speak on behalf of the people, and how hard it is for the overseers to persuade the people, that at each level, people are not immediately willing to step forward, but at least to be poor, to be oppressed, to be suffering, is to want change, even though you may want it to come magically. You may want it to come by the wave of a wand without any of the work, the sacrifice, the labor that's involved. Another way of putting it is that those who suffer, those who are truly oppressed, come to a point of desperation where it is easier to invite them to take great risks. If it is hard to invite a response from the Hebrews in Egypt, from the followers of Jesus after the event of his death hiding in the upper room, from any oppressed group that also has, so to speak, a slave consciousness, if it is hard to invite a response, a risk-taking response from them, it is surely much harder to invite people to take a risk who have a lot at stake in the present order of things. If there is one thing that we have learned, for instance, from Marxist theory and Marxist experience is that people who are comfortable are not very likely to take risks, that it involves a colossal conversion, usually by way of compassion. A colossal conversion, usually by way of a startling experience of the suffering of the poor. This is a standard story in human history. It's the story, for instance, of Siddhartha the prince who became the Buddha. The classic story is someone raised in great comfort, great luxury, great security, great pleasure, who is shaken out of it, is startled by the sudden and overwhelming experience of human misery. This is the story also of Moses. This is the story, in a sense, of Jesus. The move from uh, total security, the move from rootedness, quiet rootedness, in the Father into an experience of the unrootedness of the sheer chaos, the sheer suffering, the sheer confusion of uh, the people around him whom he identifies as his people. This is the story, if you look carefully at Christian history, of very many of our great missionary saints of our great uh, saints of charity, our great saints of um, the founding of charitable works. This is the same story over and over again. And what this thesis says, it is only with 
a vivid, shattering experience of human suffering that people are usually converted to a willingness to take very great risks, to make a great outlay of energy, a total surrender of comfort and advantages, and to take risks. Another way of putting the challenge is that the truly poor, the suffering, the oppressed, the marginated, the people who are left out, who don't count, who are crushed, truly know their need of redemption, truly know their dependence. In the more comfortable positions of society, we often have the impression that we are where we are because of our merit, because of our intelligence, because of our achieved uh, abilities and skills, and because of our sheer hard work and devotion to duty. And therefore, we are where we are because it is the proper and appropriate reward of all these outstanding virtues that we have exhibited and practiced. The truly poor, the unsuccessful, the failures, the crushed, the people who are left out, the people who are held in contempt, the people who are um, deeply suffering in the pattern of their lives know their dependence. They know their dependence on providence, though they may not call it by that name. They may call it fate, they may call it luck, but they know their dependence. They know their dependence on other people. They know their dependence on community. They know how little they are able to achieve on their own. Now, the challenge is that it is therefore out of a bitter experience of failure, of poverty, of contempt, of suffering, that one comes to appreciate the real meaning of the gospel, the real meaning of the gospel as good news. The challenge is, therefore, yes, the gospel is really good news, but it's good news to the poor. It is, it's good news to those who know their poverty. When this clarion cry was raised, largely by people who had worked among the very poor in different parts of the world, largely by theologians, and people in pastoral positions on behalf of the church who had worked among the very poor, there were bitter, bitter responses from church officials, professional theologians, and people who one way or another were pastoral experts. And the responses went something like this. Have you ever lived in a U.S. city ghetto among the deprived? Do you realize that there are many more crimes of violence being committed there? Have you ever been in a country, a, a formerly colonial um, country that is now poor and seen how the people oppress one another, that they've taken advantage over one another whenever they possibly can? Uh, have you ever observed that those who have um, gone through a great deal of suffering in their lives become very bitter, and so on? Um, all these objections were um, pouring out, and the standard objection was, you are simply idealizing the poor. The people who are really able to hear the gospel are the middle class. And... Um, this has gone so far that some scholars have put themselves out to try to prove that Jesus really preached to the middle class, that Jesus really wasn't talking to the poorest of the poor because the poor were actually in the tin mines in the Mediterranean um, islands or in slavery, um, rowing ships or whatever, in jails, and that Jesus didn't preach there. Uh, I find that objection more than scandalous. 
I, I find that objection truly uh, shocking and um, truly anti-evangelical because the theme from early Christian times has been very strong that Jesus has come to redeem from suffering, from alienation, from confusion, the poorest of the poor, that there is no horror spot, no trouble spot, no pit of human experience into which he is not able and willing to dive down and draw people up and rescue them. In response to those rather harsh and bitter objections, some so frequently praised in the literature of ancient Israel, the poor that might be designated as the Anavim, that is, simple, modest, unassuming people who don't claim special titles, who put their trust in God, who try to fulfill what God calls upon them to do, and who expect confidently that their salvation, their sustenance day by day, and their final uh, fulfillment will come directly as the gift of God in the same way that all other good things have come to them as the gift of God. The simple, the unassuming, the modest, in other words, whose practice of virtue would be not so much earning God's favor as it would be a sheer response of gratitude for God's favor, which is held out to them in any case. So that's one kind of poor. Obviously, this kind of poor are tuned in to the gospel as good news because they are tuned into everything as good news because their whole way of life is a receptivity to God revealing himself. And equally obviously, Israel knocked itself out to try to develop a culture, a way of life, a family routine, a calendar, a pattern of association in society that would keep bringing people to that focus in their lives, that would keep bringing them to that kind of poverty. Um, equally obviously, it has been the particular genius of Catholicism to try to continue that, to try to carry through that stream, to make all of our relationships, all of space and time, somehow pattern to remind us of our giftedness, pattern to remind us that we are, as it were, beggars and recipients of God's favor in every aspect of life. This kind of poverty, of course, is open to uh, people in all states of life and all conditions. There's a second kind of poverty, and it's the poverty of the destitute of refugees who are homeless and unrooted and have no future, the poverty of the hungry, the poverty of um, the unemployed, the jobless. And I think the thesis of good news to the poor, that the poor understand it better, so to speak, is very pertinent there too, but perhaps in a different way. Perhaps the temptation of the destitute is to despair, as the temptation of the well-to-do is to pride, to vanity, to self-satisfaction, to self-centeredness, to selfishness. Perhaps the temptation of the destitute is to violence in obvious external ways, as the temptation of the well-to-do is to acquire subtle violence by which they cement themselves into their well-to-do position and make sure that others may not encroach, by which they manage to make laws that keep the poor down or international trading agreements that keep the underdeveloped countries at another level, and so on. Um, 
the destitute, the poor, the hungry, the homeless, uh, the jobless have their own kinds of temptations. And yet, the message that the gospel of Jesus is good news, but it's good news to those who are poor, I think here also finds a special relevance. Namely, that you cannot be in those situations of suffering without knowing your need. The particular virtue, the particular openness to the gospel is the fact that need is so obvious, dependence is so obvious in that kind of poverty. Then there is another kind of poverty that consists of oppression. Most of the oppressed are also poor physically, but that isn't the only point to note. There are people who are oppressed are oppressed because they're persecuted on account of their skin color, their language, their religious affiliation, or some other um, quality in their um, personal experience and heritage. The experience of oppression is the experience of the poor in a very special way. Is it clearer what the gospel of Jesus is about, what salvation is about, if you're hearing it from the stance of oppression. Well, historically that seems to um, ring true. After all, Jesus in his own time preached among people who were quite harshly oppressed by the Roman occupation, who were quite harshly oppressed by the collaborators from their own people who were prepared to implement the Roman occupation among them. Um, he spoke to people who had been despised as Jews for centuries by different kinds of uh, foreign conquests, by different kinds of dispersions into exile, by different kinds of harsh and discriminating laws. And it would seem that the revivals of Christianity, the revivals of the way of Jesus, the revivals of gospel fervor, have quite routinely through history happened among those who one way or another were oppressed, persecuted, discriminated against, and crushed. Why would the message of hope, the message of the gospel, be so particularly clear to them? Several reasons, but I think most obviously because the message of the gospel, if we take it pinpointed in the crucifixion of Jesus, is that the power of God is manifest in human weakness, that the power of God is displayed, is exercised, comes to fulfillment, to focus, to fruition in human society when human beings are not able to rely on the power to compel others but must rely on basic, naked, sheer humanity, must rely on the simple presence in freedom, the simple presence to others to appeal on the level of conscience, on the level of fellowship, on the level of common destiny, on the level of common experience, rather than appealing to others as though in some sense those others were things to be manipulated. When we speak of power, we more usually mean the ability to compel by external force, the ability somehow to reduce the other to a thing, rather than to approach the other as person, to approach the other as subject. And I think the overwhelming 
message of the crucifixion of Jesus, of the putting of history upside down to read it from the vantage point of the loser is to find that the power of God is a power that doesn't deny the personhood of the other, the power that doesn't work by compelling, by external sanction. It's a power that works by intrinsic sanction, that is to say, because it is the truth of our relationships with one another. The extraordinary thing about the position of the oppressed, which you might call the privileged position of the oppressed, is that as they are represented by Jesus crucified, the oppressed experience themselves as stripped of all power to compel. I'm talking, of course, of a kind of ideal type of the oppressed. In other words, any one person may be oppressed in some respects and quite a bully in others. A man may be oppressed as a worker in his society and a horrendous bully in his family. But I'm talking about the um, ideal type of the oppressed, that is to say the oppressed as oppressed in a kind of um, abstraction as though we would find someone who is purely oppressed. And Jesus crucified is the figure of the purely oppressed. And the extraordinary revelation that comes out of the experience of total oppression is that there is a power of God that is not the power to compel, to bully, to reduce the other to object, but that the power of God is the power of relating subject to subject, person to person, conscience to conscience, uh, hope to hope, faith to faith, and love to love. That it's the power to summon forth humanity, to summon forth personhood, to summon forth community from the other. And that when all other power is stripped away, this is where the power of God is released in human experience. It is in that sense that we can say, yes, the poor who are truly the oppressed are in a position to hear the word of God in the person of Jesus as genuinely good news, in a position to hear the word of God as the crucified Jesus as genuinely good news. Then there is another kind of poverty and this we have appreciated in spite of our inadequate theological way of coping with the problem of poverty. There is the poverty of the poor by choice. And Christian tradition has resonated with, uh, re-echoed again and again with the experience of people who have said I think I will understand the truth of my relationship to God better if I can unload some of my attachments to things, if I can cut off some of my dependence on status, on respect, on titles, on dignity in life, if I can abandon my ambitions, my personal ambitions, to get a foothold in the world, to make security for myself in the world by my achievements, and if I can cut loose and depend more on the providence of God wherever it will lead me. From early times in Christian experience, this kind of poverty has been more or less honored. I say more or less. It's always stood as a sign of contradiction and people have always been a little ambivalent about it and yet have known that they couldn't but at least give lip service to it because it sounded so like the gospel and because it seemed to have such good warrant. 
I believe that that kind of poverty, especially when it springs from a deep source of compassion, when it springs up from an experience, a shocking experience, of the suffering of the poor, of the oppressed, of the marginated, of the people who are held in contempt and despised. I believe that this kind of poverty, when it springs from that kind of compassion and when it's carried through with a certain sincerity and humility, is the link between that primordial kind of poverty and oppression and deprivation and suffering in which the readiness for the word is found and on the other hand the tradition that carries over the word itself. I believe that that kind of chosen poverty, chosen identification with suffering is the missing link. The missing link that brings the word of God to the poor and brings the experience of the poor articulately, audibly, perceptibly, critically to the listening to and study of the Word of God as it's handed down to us in history. And finally, of course, among the kinds of poverty, there is the poverty of Jesus. The poverty that becomes the kingpin, the linchpin that holds the human situation together redemptively. And the poverty of Jesus is, I think, to be understood as a combination of the different kinds of poverty that I have spoken of here. In other words, even as the gospel spells out for us the life story of Jesus, you have the combination of the poverty of the anavim, the simple, the unassuming, the modest. You have Jesus presented as someone who loves the beauties of nature, who enjoys encounters with people, fellowship, friendship, appreciates children, has a keen eye for quaint and whimsical and funny situations in human experience and is quietly at peace in his own life with God, with the Father. You have the picture of Jesus as someone who has the patience to work as a craftsman well into his adult years as someone who studies the situation quite calmly and quite slowly and then lets himself be led into his vocation. Secondly, we have the picture of Jesus as destitute and homeless in a rather literal sense that as he lets himself be led, he is in fact dependent on the charity of others. He experiences in depth and without disturbance, but in its reality, the, ex the experience, the life quality of being just quite totally dependent on others for hospitality. Uh, the experience of having to ask for uh, the loan of things, for the gift of things. We have the experience, we have the picture of Jesus as certainly par excellence, the one who is poor by choice, who is poor by compassion, who is poor because he makes himself step by step the companion, uh, the fellow sufferer of those who suffer oppression homelessness, physical poverty and want, 
abuse, contempt, and uh, the loss of a future, hopelessness for the future. And we have the picture, finally, of Jesus as identified with the utterly oppressed, identified with the totally futureless of the world, those who simply have no place because their name is contempt and um, despicable those who are marginated or excluded from society held to be unworthy even to be on the earth. I think when we look at the understanding of poverty in the sense of these different dimensions, aspects, components of it, the message becomes very clear uh, that indeed the gospel is preached as the redemptive news, the good news, the happy news announced to the poor, to those who have need of it. And it becomes quite clear that the professional theologian, the expert, the person who uh, is responsible for handing on the tradition of the faith, its understanding, its technical um, meaning and exposition, need not really be uh, threatened by the claim that the gospel is good news only to the poor for two reasons that there is a reciprocity, a link, a collaboration between the expertise of learning and the expertise of suffering and of need. And secondly, that that collaboration happens not only as between one group of people and another group of people, but it must progressively and continually happen within those who have the expertise of learning. That, of course, is in its own way threatening because it asks for a very radical and continuing conversion as the condition for truly doing theology, as the condition for truly doing pastoral work, as the condition for truly understanding the technical aspects of Christian doctrine and its theological elaboration. Among the people in history who has grasped this in a quite extraordinary way, one of my favorites is Teresa of Avila. When you read the writings of Teresa of Avila, you get a quaint mixture of abject humility, where she's talking about being only a poor woman and therefore, of course, not knowing properly how to organize her thoughts and present them and not knowing really how to interpret her experiences or describe them. Um, and therefore, she asks that theologians and experts correct what she has to say. You get a quaint mixture of this on the one hand with a dogged assertion on the other hand, I know all about this, I have lots and lots of experience of this, and therefore I know what I'm saying is true. And those matters in which she says she has lots and lots of experience are usually those aspects in which she learned from her suffering, in which she learned from her experience of her own inability to cope with illness, uh, with her uh, own identity problems, with a complicated situation she was in, or with her own hopeless difficulties in prayer over a long period of time. The situation, I think, in our contemporary experience, though it's not concerned with prayer, 
uh, primarily, but with um, the understanding of the gospel in relation to social situations, in relation to lifestyle, in relation to building up the patterns of the church. The situation is, I think, not unlike that and brings us back to that same thesis that uh, the cross of Jesus set at the center of history and the center of our Christian experience asks us to start looking at all of history and human experience upside down from the point of view of the loser, of the vanquished, the excluded, the oppressed, the poor, the suffering, because that is where Jesus himself stands. And that is where the meaning of the gospel as being truly good news is revealed to us. I will stop there so the people who have 11.05 classes can get to them. But afterwards, I will respond to questions or comments, whatever. what we're doing in the Eucharist is coming back time and again with our renewed and increased life experience with our new social situations with our new um, culture and so on and bringing that again and again into the mystery of the death and the resurrection of Jesus. I believe it's for that reason that the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy of Vatican II makes an issue of it that the liturgy really is nothing if you separate it from life. That if you slice it off the top of your uh, life experience and life activities and tick it off as an obligation that's been performed, it's a waste of time. I, and the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy emphasizes that it has significance, it has meaning, it has impact to the extent that we bring our lives to it, our life experience, and our increasing, continuing, cumulative life experience uh, to it, and that we draw from it a whole new approach to that life experience so that it becomes, as the uh, Constitution says, the peak or summit of Christian life. Um, I think it is that in the sense that Jesus said to us, come back here over and over again, meet me here, meet me here in person. I know that it is desperately difficult for you to understand what is the meaning of my dying this death. I know that you would like it better with a whole different scenario. You would like it if I had taken your advice and kept a low profile, stayed out of Jerusalem at that tricky, explosive time of the Passover feast, maybe gone across the Jordan or maybe gone back to Galilee quietly as a country preacher, arousing piety and devotion from those individuals who would listen you would like it better if I had lived out my life to a ripe old age as a famous religious teacher, a kind of guru for uh, future times to whom people could look as the teacher of wisdom. And if the typical icon that you could keep of me would have me in a sitting position uh, with my hand raised as the teacher and a book in my left hand. You would like it better if the typical icon that you would have to keep of me over the centuries would not be a crucified, tortured person um, executed in a civil uh, trial and execution as a criminal 
in the midst of all kinds of ambivalence and ambiguity, uh, misunderstanding and um, tragedy. You would like it better if you wouldn't have to remember that your role in this was that you ran away. You would like it better if you didn't have to remember that right up to the end, I was having to tell you that you hadn't understood it. You would like it better if I had, after all, led Israel to independence and provided a, a, a redemption of the sort that you expected. I know that all of this is very hard for you and that you don't understand it, but come back and meet me here because I am setting the shocking, brutal reality of my death, the brutal, secular reality of my death, into a framework that you already recognize as a religious framework, but a framework that sends you back to some very, very basic themes, the themes of peoplehood and trust in God, the themes of the Exodus, where your liberation came out of your utter weakness and your willingness to make the leap of faith, where your relationship with God is seen to be realized precisely in your peoplehood with one another, where I called you out of slavery by dint of making you accept responsibility and fellowship with one another, where you would never have um, enjoyed freedom if you had not allowed me to summon forth your own uh, individual freedom in um, generosity and in outreach to one another to be a community. So I think Jesus is saying, here is something that is going to be very hard for you to face, now, not only now but in the future. Um, when across the barrier of my death I finally am able to communicate to you my spirit in a whole new burst of life, you will be able to understand bit by bit, little by little, why I would have gone through this death, why I would have chosen it. In fact, you will understand bit by bit, in greater depth, why I sparked so much hostility, why I polarized people so much that they were determined to get me out of the road and kill me. You will understand it because as the master is, so the disciples will be. You will spark also that kind of hostility. You will meet that kind of opposition. And therefore, I ask you to keep coming back to this point to understand what this is all about. And Paul, of course, in the um, first letter to the Corinthians, underscores this and says, but don't you understand that community is the name of the game? Don't you understand that what he's saying to you is that he is setting his death in the frame, the interpretive frame of reference of Exodus because he's calling you into community. He's calling you to be his risen body in the world. And that is the meaning of his death, to be for others. And the death that he's asking you to participate is not necessarily your martyrdom in the literal sense of the word. It's your giving up of these private projects in order to be for others, to be again community, so that a people which was not a people uh, can be brought to birth, so that those who were scattered can be called forth into peoplehood. I don't know if that answers enough what you're asking.
but the call you articulated, uh, the gospel of calling us to worship God, turned us upside down. Okay, I'd like to address it to the, when we look at the church in North America, the first world, we're a church uh, of the middle class. Uh, look at our parish councils. Uh, look at the, the number of uh, religious that, that have ministries to, to the rich, mm-hmm. schools for um, upper class. Um, uh, we, we see, uh, in many cases, rationalizations about not being uh, with, uh, with the poor uh, and defensiveness. And uh, I guess the question is, really, if, if we heard this message, mm-hmm. those in charge of the church in North America would almost have to commit class suicide. That, uh, you know, it's your average middle class people on parish councils, on diocesan uh, pastoral uh, councils. Uh, I would imagine many in charge of religious communities on governing boards and superiors and this kind of thing have come from the uh, from middle class. And, and so how can we really those in power mm-hmm. in the church. Uh, so I'm focusing on, on that group, uh, those who, who have power in very uh, degrees. About, uh, I mean, can we expect them to turn the church up, upside down and really have the agenda of the poor be on our parish council uh, meetings? Uh, so I'm kind of look, uh, looking for advice, direction on the very practical application Mm -hmm. Uh, Right. I don't think it really can come from the top down um, because conversions never do. The popes of the past hundred years or so have been very insistent in speaking on behalf of the poor and for all the plea that they have made we've responded very little. I don't see we haven't responded at all because, for instance, the kinds of things that Leo XIII was saying about a living wage for workers, the kinds of things that came in very, very slowly about the right to um, organize unions and so on, those have now rather generally been accepted, not only by Catholics but by the society at large. But then the very radical message of, say, Popolorum Progressio, of Paul VI, on the um, relationship of peace and security and well-being to the sharing of resources and the listening to the poorer nations and so on. I think that's still been buried. Very little of that has come through. And the very radical message of Pacem Interis of uh, Pope John the Twenty Third on the need for real peace in the world, for constructive building of peace that goes far beyond um, maintaining a balance of, of uh, power in nuclear weapons so that both sides will be afraid and so on. Um, I think the answer is that that kind of guidance must come from above, but that the real conversion can't really come from above, that you can't expect that to do uh, the whole thing. I have great confidence in the groups that I mentioned uh, last night, the um, Comunidades de Base, the basic uh, Christian communities that are springing up in many places. I have great confidence in a renewed spirit of prayer in many communities. My same friend Teresa of Avila had a very bright uh, remark to make when she said, you know, to convert your life may not really be in your power. So the thing is to keep giving God your attention. Her plea was that people should persevere in uh, personal prayer, personal mental prayer. And she said, the one thing you can do is keep giving God your attention. 
Because if you do that, God eventually is able to do everything with you. But you've got to keep giving God your attention. For that reason, I find it as very hopeful that there are such widespread, pervasive renewals of prayer um, in the Catholic Church and in the various uh, churches. Something that I find particularly hopeful in our Catholic contemporary experience is the introduction or the reintroduction of communal penance celebrations. Now, in spite of the fact that the model that we have functioning now is rather um, confused, that is to say a communal penance celebration it's still including individual confessions and absolutions. In spite of that, I think communal penance celebrations are a real um, vantage point for the introduction of a larger perception of conversion and repentance. The difficulty, but I'm going to talk about this this afternoon uh, a bit too, the difficulty of the Catholic practice of uh, the ritual of repentance in the sacrament of penance since the 12th, since the 13th century, excuse me, since the early 13th century, the difficulty of that is that it has really reduced the process of repentance to an examination of conscience in which I say, now I know the rules, have I kept them? I know what it means to live as a Christian, but am I doing it? And I think the whole task of ongoing repentance and conversion goes deeper than that. It's, have I understood properly uh, why these are perceived to be the rules, what's behind them? Have I understood properly what it is to be a Christian? In other words, the real examination of conscience has to be not, have I lived up to my lights as I had these lights as I saw it, but did I see right? To have to open my eyes wider is the more to see. And I see as an immensely hopeful development in the Catholic experience of our times, the reintroduction of communal penance celebrations, because in those, you can make the appeal to conversion on the basis of compassion. Instead of just scolding and bullying people through the homilies, the sermons, the readings, the maybe uh, multimedia presentations that you include in the uh, celebration, you can introduce uh, bit by bit an appeal to compassion. You can, in other words, uh, begin quietly, bit by bit, to show people what the world looks like from the vantage point of the oppressed and ask, what is our role as Christians in responding to that? And I don't think you have to scold them or say that they're guilty. I think you just have to say, here is the suffering of the world, and we as Christians, what are we doing about it? And I think you can introduce it bit by bit. Simply to have a conversion of consciousness, it really in the literal sense, a metanoia or a change of mentality, a change of vision. That's what I think is the hopeful uh, point to latch on to. Yes. Thank you. 
Uh, uh, did you hear the um, observations? The speaker said that she had come to realize much of what I just said today in her own life experience, but she wondered why I hadn't made any application to the situation of women in the world and the bullying patterns of men. She didn't use that term in relation <laughs> to uh, women. That has, in fact, come out very strongly recently in liberation theology. Liberation theology began with the sense of the marginated poor over against the powerful in the structures of society and found progressively that the patterns of oppression had to be seen in one-to-one -one relationships as well as in the large economic and political ones. I have been very moved by a number of statements by Latin American priest theologians who have said, um, I have been involved now for some time in championing the rights of the poor and in working in a liberation movement and it is gradually becoming plain to me that perhaps the first place we have to start to work on changing our perceptions is the pervasive habit or um, stance of machismo in which I myself am involved. I've been impressed by the number of Latin American priest theologians who have said that. I've also been...